Welcome back, my name is Greg Martin. This is a series we're doing on epidemiology. And in this video, we're gonna be looking at reasons for correlation, and it includes how we better understand causation and criteria that we might use to sort of uh, look under the hood there. Okay, so all of the slides that I'm showing, well, in this video, there's just gonna be this slide. They're available at learnmore365.com. You can download the slide and have a look at it there if you want it for your study purposes. Anyway, let's jump right in. Reasons why there might be a correlation between an exposure and an outcome. The first and most obvious one is that we think there might be some sort of causative relationship, but we can't jump to that conclusion just yet. There may be other reasons, and just to quickly go through them so that you've got this checklist in your mind, there could be reverse causation. In other words, the outcome that you're interested in might itself be influencing or be a, there might be a causative relationship with the exposure that you're interested in. The sort of direction of travel might be a little different to what you expect. Let me give you an example. Um, if a person is depressed, they may exercise less. We typically think of exercise as an exposure, an intervention that then translates into some sort of health outcome. But it might be the case that a certain health outcome itself has a causative relationship with an exposure that we're interested in. Okay, so the direction of causality uh, is important and it may incorrectly give you a sense that the correlation that you're seeing is uh, represents a causative relationship between exposure and outcome. Okay, good, moving right along. Chance, right? You can do a study and just by sheer chance, just by accident, you bump into a correlation which is spurious. Uh, this is the reason why we do robust statistical analysis, why we have study design, where we're very careful about how we select uh, who's in the study, et cetera, et cetera. People get it wrong uh, or, you know, so but in this particular instance, chance can account for a correlation that doesn't really exist. So this is why studies need to be replicatable, right? And we look at the same thing again and again and again. And then over time, we get a consensus about what's really going on. The other way to avoid chance being a problem is to get a nice, healthy sample size in your study, right? Confounding. And we're going to talk a lot about confounding in this series on epidemiology. Really what confounding is, is it's when there is an alternative explanation for the relationship between an exposure and an outcome. Let me explain. Okay, here's an example. We might see a correlation between uh, eating ice cream and being attacked by sharks, right? Uh, you know, so, so as ice cream eating goes up, shark attacks go up and we say, ooh, eating ice cream must cause shark attacks. Well, no, the reason is both eating ice cream and being attacked by a shark are both themselves associated with warm weather. Right, so as the temperature goes up in the middle of summer, people eat more ice cream. It's also they swim more in the sea and they're more likely to get eaten by a shark. So both the exposure and the outcome themselves are associated with a third factor. If you do any kind of research, I am about to blow your mind. Watch this. I've come to consensus and I've put in my research question. And what I want to know is what is in the literature. Now, consensus is an AI search engine for research. I've asked the question, does social media negatively impact mental health? Let's see what Consensus says. Consensus not only gives you a snapshot synopsis of what the research says, but it also allows you to look under the hood at the strength of the research that is informing the answer to that question. So if we look at our consensus meter, we can expand it out and look at not just the numbers, but the quality of the papers that contribute to the answers that are given. It also provides you with a narrative or a little literature review on the subject, and you can click on any of the references and it'll take you down to information about that paper. And once you're at the paper, you can click here, ask for more information about the methods, outcomes, results, etc., etc., the type of study that was done, the rigor of the journal that was published in, the number of citations, and more. And here is one of my favorite features of Consensus, where the paper is available, and if it's not, you can upload it. There is a ask this paper function. Now yeah, you can read the paper, but of course you can ask questions and consensus will provide an answer like, were there any conflicts of interest? Summarize the paper for me. Does the paper take age into account? And you can type in any additional questions you want right there and an answer will appear on the screen. Unbelievable. So take a look at consensus today. I'll put a link in the description below. You will absolutely love it. Breaking news, you can get one year of free consensus premium if you use the offer code GREG100, and it's capital G-R-E-G 100, one year for free. That's amazing. Do it now, consensus.app. And that third factor can't be on the sort of causal pathway between the exposure and the outcome, and we call it a confounding variable. Right, 
uh, very important and that can incorrectly give you a sense that there's a causative relationship between an exposure and outcome. You will see a correlation, but it isn't a real correlation. It's caused by a confounding variable. Then I've said bias. Some people think of confounding as a type of bias. I don't. I think of confounding as something different because if you collect information about confounding variables, you can still draw the correct conclusion from your study. Your study itself is not necessarily biased. You can still actually you know, have a, uh, you know, draw correct conclusions. A biased study, something is amiss. You've, and we'll do a whole video about bias, but really bias, you've either collected the data incorrectly, you've categorized, you know, the in something incorrectly, and the data you've got is not reliable. Um, and so uh, a bias can incorrectly give you a sense of, of causation. And, uh, it will, will, can give you a correlation that's not real. Right, so if we think, um, we've got a relationship and we've considered reverse causality, chance, confounding and bias. And then you can add to that list uh, fraud. Okay, by the way, fraud and error. But that's also for another video. How do we strengthen the argument that in actual fact, there is a causative relationship? And there are the Bradford Hill criteria. Now, no one of these is absolutely essential. In other words, any one of these might be missing. Uh, and no one of them is absolutely conclusive that there's a causative relationship. But taken together, the more of these tick boxes, the more reliable, the more convinced we can be that there's a causative relationship. Let me go through them quickly. Temporality, the exposure precedes the outcome, right? That suggests, suggests, doesn't prove, suggests there's a causative relationship. The strength of association, right? So there's a really strong correlation. As one goes up, the other one goes up uh, concomitantly in a reliable way. Uh, consistency, so basically whenever there is the exposure, we see the outcome. Biological gradient, lots of the drug turns into lots of uh, health or lots of poison turns into lots of death. So as the dose goes up, there's a corresponding increase in the outcome that we're interested in. Plausibility, you know, some and plausibility, I think of this as the one that really goes backwards. In other words, it, causation can be excluded when the relationship is not plausible. So if you told me, for example, that um, uh, there's a relationship between star signs and good health, I would say it's not plausible. There's no, there's no plausible mechanism there. And uh, I don't believe that there's a causative relationship. Coherency, which kind of means like when we look at different types of studies, epidemiological and lab studies, they all paint the same picture. Experiment, this is a good one. This is where we actually intervene and see what then comes of that intervention. We give drugs to groups of people and we, well, a group of people and not the other group, and we see what happens and we look at the difference between them. So experimentation, actual intervention, can give a strong argument for causation. Um, analogy, there may be a separate exposure outcome, but that's very similar in terms of the biological mechanisms. We know that there's a causative relationship. In the other set of circumstances, it may strengthen the argument for a causative relationship in the set of circumstances that we're looking at. And specificity, this particular exposure translates consistently with that particular outcome and not necessarily a whole range of possible outcomes. Uh, within the mix is the one that you're interested in. Okay. If any one of these is missing, it's not the end of the world. If any one of these are present, it's not conclusively proof that there's causation taken together. These things try and help strengthen the argument. I hope this was useful. Don't ever change, don't do drugs, always do your best. You can download this, what you're looking at at the moment, at learnmore365.com. Just click on the link that's on the screen at the moment. Speak to you soon. Take care.